Why does the New York Times so often get military topics wrong? The conflict in Gaza has been raging for about three months now, and Israel effectively lost the information war 10 days into the fight. A big reason for that was the New York Times. I'm going to talk about media bias, but first give me 60 seconds to pay the bills here. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. I recently got into the TV show Archer. It is endlessly quotable and hilarious, but not available on Netflix here in America. So I've been relying on private internet access to watch the show. So click the link in the description below or go to piavpn.com slash Macbeth to get 83% off plus four months free. Now, a VPN or a virtual private network hides your IP address that hackers and rogue government agents have a much harder time tracking your online activities. And one of the things that I like is that private internet access is actually open source. You can download their source from GitHub. Private Internet Access has clients for Mac, PC, and Linux, as well as iOS and Android. And Private Internet Access doesn't limit your devices, so you can be on multiple devices at the same time. When I want to watch Archer, I just fire up Private Internet Access, put it into a UK streaming optimized mode, and watch the show. My computer thinks I'm in the UK, and I can watch the show in peace. So click the link in the description below, or go to PIAVPN slash Macbeth to get 83% off, plus four months free, and give yourself a much larger Netflix viewing library. Now let's get back to the New York Times. Now this video is probably going to get shared a lot, so allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ryan Macbeth. I spent 20 years as a heavy weapons and anti-armor infantryman with a handful of deployments, the last one to Iraq. While serving, I obtained a bachelor's degree in computer science, a master's in engineering management, and after I retired, I got an MSc in cybersecurity. I ended up working for Accenture, where I mainly programmed C4ISR software. This means command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Basically, I used software to find bad guys, and then I gave that information to my client, who would either continue surveillance or use more kinetic measures against the target. So I know a little bit about intelligence collection analysis and how the military works. Also note that all the files associated with this video, search terms, and links can be found at ryanbetthatsubstack.com absolutely for free. Let's get started. On November 17th, 2023, an explosion occurred at Ali Arab Hospital in the Gaza Strip. At 2.12 p.m., the New York Times retweeted, Breaking news, an Israeli airstrike hit Gaza hospital on Tuesday, killing at least 200 Palestinians, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, which said the number of casualties was expected to rise. This gets shared about 700 times. By 2.52, the New York Times sends out another tweet saying, Update, at least 500 people were killed by an Israeli airstrike at a Gaza hospital, the Palestinian Health Ministry said, follow our live coverage. This gets shared about 600 times. At 3.46 Eastern Time in the U.S., the New York Times reports the following on the front page of their website. Israel strike kills hundreds in hospital, Palestinians say. By 6.46 p.m., the headline was changed to Israelis and Palestinians blame each other for blast at Gaza hospital that killed hundreds. But the damage had already been done. So how did the New York Times get this so wrong? You know, I've been doing YouTube for almost three years now, and I've spoken with quite a few journalists who wanted to interview me. And they wanted to interview me because they're researching stories about tanks or misinformation or anti-tank weapons, and they want to get the story right. Nobody goes into work wanting to do a bad job. There's this excellent book by uh, Sidney Decker called A Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. And it theorizes that there is no such thing as human error. It's really that all human error is a product of competing priorities or focus of attention. Now, Sidney Decker is mainly known for investigating plane crashes, and it's safe to say that no pilot gets up in the morning intending to crash, right? And by that same logic, no journalist goes into work in the morning going, boy, I hope I get a story wrong today. I hope I totally screw it up. I hope to, I have to print a retraction. I want to totally lose the trust of the public today, right? Nobody does that. Now, journalists are under enormous pressure in a 24-hour news cycle to be the first to publish. But what if there's more than that? What if the problem isn't competing priorities or a 24-hour news cycle? but an underlying culture of military ignorance in the newsroom. When the Ali Arab hospital explosion occurred, I made a video where I explained how to use Intelligence Community Directive 203, or ICD-203, 
to analyze the most likely cause of the explosion. And this can be used for almost anything in the intelligence community. ICD-203 is the gold standard in the intelligence community to evaluate probability. So in an explosion like this, there's basically four possibilities. An intentional bombing by Israel, an accidental bombing by Israel, an intentional explosion set by Hamas, or an accidental explosion caused by Hamas. Now, there could be other possibilities like a propane tank explosion or uh, a meteorite, but as the old medical axiom goes, when you hear the sound of hooves, think horses, not zebras. And yeah, meteorite and uh, propane explosions, they happen during wartime as well, but we're trying to find the most likely cause of something. So let's look at number one, the intentional bombing of that hospital by Israel. Well, what is the tactical or strategic advantage that Israel gets from attacking a hospital weighed against the international outcry of performing a strike? You're not going to drop a JDAM or Joint Direct Attack Munition, which incidentally costs between $21,000 and $36,000 on a hospital for the lulls. <laughs> These weapon systems have a dollar value and you're limited in stock. So it's really not something I see Israel doing intentionally without a really good reason. Now, would Israel attack a hospital if they had good intelligence that a high value Hamas leader was there? Yeah, they might. But they'd be a little more surgical than using the kind of weapon that would cause 500 casualties that the Palestinian Health Ministry claimed. They would use a smaller warhead, a smaller guided missile. So the disadvantage of a strike combined with the incredibly high number of casualties makes an intentional Israeli strike unlikely. So let's look at number two. Could this have been an accidental Israeli strike? Well, JDAMs or Joint Direct Attack Munitions, like the kind used by Israel, are guided precisely to a location by GPS. It's not unheard of for GPS to fail, especially if there's tall buildings around that can interrupt the signal. I'm sure you've pulled uh, out of the building in your car in the city and your, your GPS Waze doesn't work, right? Waze has to establish a connection first. So that can happen, but precision guided munitions don't tend to fail that often. And uh, Gaza is what's called a permissive environment, meaning that there's nobody around there with jammers intentionally trying to jam the GPS signal to get those bombs to fall off course. So I would call that an unlikely. So let's look at number three. Could Hamas have intentionally detonated an explosive? I don't think so. Every weapon system has a dollar value, and Hamas knows that it's not going to get any more supplies once the invasion happens. So it wouldn't make tactical or strategic sense to waste a weapon system on, what, international sympathy? Plus, the casualty count is way too high. Even the worst vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices used in Iraq or Afghanistan caused 50 to 100 casualties, although a recent one in Mogadishu was far higher. So I would call Hamas intentionally exploding a weapon system for international sympathy to be unlikely. But what about number four? What about the possibility of Hamas accidentally causing the explosion with a failed rocket? We've seen it in the past. Between 15 and 20% of Palestinian Qassam rockets fail. So I would certainly call rocket failure to be likely. As it turned out, that's exactly what happened. Now, the thought exercise that I just did with ICD-203 could be done by a 19-year-old U.S. Army 35 Foxtrot all-source intelligence analyst after about 13 weeks of training. So, if a 19-year-old kid could do it, a 19-year-old kid who didn't even go to college, why couldn't the New York Times? So, I looked into the three reporters who contributed to the story. They were Aaron Boxerman, Patrick Kinsley, and Hiba Yazbek. And it didn't look like any of these journalists served in the military. And if you want to look for yourself, the links to the LinkedIn pages for these journalists are on my Substack. Now, not having served in the military is not necessarily a disqualifier for writing about the military. But if you're writing about basic military and intelligence topics, and you don't have the same level of understanding as a 19-year-old kid who just graduated Army basic training, maybe you ought to double check your sources. Or at least maybe you ought to have some people on the team who know a little bit about the military. I mean, the New York Times thinks it's important in other areas. Get a Aporia Mandeville. She's a New York Times science writer. She has a BS in chemistry and an MS in biochemistry. I got a feeling she knows what she's talking about when she writes about infectious diseases. 
Or Jesse Wegman, he writes about uh, the Supreme Court and legal affairs. He attended the New York University School of Law. He can probably talk about law. Now, that, that doesn't mean a food critic needs to be a chef or a theater critic needs to be an actor. It probably helps, but I don't think it's totally necessary. But for complex topics like science or law, the New York Times seems to make an effort in putting the right people in the right places. The military is a complex topic, and it's only getting harder, especially as we see the advent of unmanned systems, AI-powered loitering munitions, and information warfare. So how many people who work for the New York Times have served in the military? What's their base level of institutional knowledge? So to start, let's see if we can figure out how many people work for the New York Times. So if you go to LinkedIn and you do a simple search for people who work for the New York Times in the U.S., you arrive at a figure of about uh, 8,700 people. Now, there could be errors in here. There may be people who claim they work for the New York Times when maybe they're a freelancer who sold a story once or they switched jobs and never updated their LinkedIn, but it's about the best I can do with open source resources here. Let's do another search and see how many people who work for the New York Times have served in the military. Now that number is 29. If you want to replicate this search, you can get the exact search link at ryanmcbeth.substack.com. So the New York Times employs 29 veterans out of 8,700 staff. That's less than 1%. That's 0.33% to be exact. That's roughly the same odds as you drawing a straight in poker. And not all of these veterans are reporters who have a direct effect on stories. Some are sound engineers or project managers. And I think a little piece of the New York Times puzzle may have fallen into place here. Maybe the New York Times gets the military side of the story wrong because they just don't have the foundation of personnel on board to get it right. Ask yourself this. How many goals does soccer have? It's two goals, right? How do you know that? Well, you probably played soccer or you've seen soccer on TV. You've walked by a soccer field on the way home from the park. So if someone came to you and said, no, 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 soccer actually has four goals, not two, you'd be pretty suspicious, right? Because it flies in the face of your entire life experience and all of your institutional knowledge about soccer. You have this baseline of institutional knowledge. So what if someone came to you and made a claim about a war crime or military hardware? or the casualty figures of an attack. Would you have the tools in your toolkit to raise suspicion? And if you don't, but your job is to cover conflict, why the heck haven't you made an effort to hire those people? The New York Times has an entire webpage devoted to DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is very, very important. They have a plan to increase hiring of women and people of color. And that plan ends with the sentence, we are convinced that by fully unleashing the talents of a diverse workforce, it can be stronger still with richer journalism, a broader audience, and a stronger business. But the plan doesn't include hiring more veterans. And based on what I've seen, veterans are the most unrepresented minority at the New York Times. And this lack of veterans has a direct effect on the accuracy and quality of reporting at the New York Times. Okay, so, so maybe, other news organizations are getting it right. Maybe other newspapers have made an effort to hire veterans. Out of 3,400 staff, the Wall Street Journal only has eight ex-military employees. That's 0.21%. The Washington Post is a little better. They have 19 veterans out of 3,500 staff. That's 0.54%. Now, I tried to do something similar with cable news. I found out that most on-air talent doesn't tend to have a LinkedIn page. Uh, that might be more of an entertainment industry thing where perhaps getting a job is more related to who your agent knows than who you know on LinkedIn. So this might not be a fair comparison, but I tried comparing cable news reporters and contributors with lists that I mainly pulled off of their websites. Fox News has the highest number of veterans on staff, 10 out of 164 reporters and contributors. Newsmax was second with four out of 26. Uh, incidentally, Newsmax has the highest percentage of veterans in their staff. MSNBC was next with one out of 44 reporters being veterans. And CNN doesn't have a single military veteran as a reporter or contributor out of 155 reporters. Fox News and Newsmax are an American news outlet that tend to lean right 
in their reporting. So it might not be a surprise that they hire more veterans on staff. The New York Times tends to lean left. And I'm kind of reminded of a famous quote about the Hells Angel Motorcycle Club. In a 1966 interview with Ebony Magazine, a white Hells Angel Club member was asked if there was race prejudice in their motorcycle club because it didn't seem like there were any black members of the Hells Angels. To which the Hells Angel replied that there was no specific prohibition on black members, but nobody who was black ever tried to join. So maybe veterans don't try to join the New York Times, and the New York Times doesn't make a particularly special effort to reach out to them. Now, like I said before, just because you didn't serve in the military doesn't mean that you can't write about the military. I mean, after all, if you look at CNN, they have zero reporters who are military veterans. And I don't think you would consider Christiane Amanpour unqualified to talk about military operations. But I think this lack of veteran representation increases the risk of newspapers getting the story wrong. You know, I read the New York Times every day. I'm usually up at 5 a.m. and I have a routine. I check my email. I check my Twitter, I go over some defense and cybersecurity related newsletters that I get, I drink my coffee, I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Reuters, Ground News, and now with the war in Israel, I read Haaretz. And I saw this article in the New York Times, U.S. military returns to jungle, training for a very different threat. Note that the two journalists who reported on this story, Damian Cave and Mark Abramson, are not military veterans. Wasn't a bad article. And then I got to this portion where I saw this very simple but embarrassing mistake. It was about a river crossing. During the river crossing, even competent officers drifted and needed help. At one point, as the cloudy sky turned charcoal gray at sunset, a soldier's M4 machine gun fell to the murky bottom, slowing everyone down until it could be recovered. An M4 isn't a machine gun. It's a carbine. It even says it in the manual. I would even accept the word rifle. Machine guns, on the other hand, tend to be belt-fed, crew-served, and have interchangeable barrels that are capable of sustained automatic fire. A soldier who completed 10 weeks of basic training wouldn't get this wrong. So why did the New York Times get a, such a simple fact wrong? And you might be rolling your eyes right now and saying that calling an M4 rifle a machine gun is a technicality. I mean, yeah, an M4 rifle can fire like a machine gun in a three-round burst, but it would be like calling a golf cart a car. I mean, if you called a golf cart a car, I would kind of know what you meant, but it's still inaccurate. And inaccurate reporting, especially if read by decision makers, can have some pretty catastrophic consequences. While writing this, I was reminded of a scene in the movie Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned How to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. If you've never seen the movie, it's set during the 1960s and it involves this Air Force general who goes crazy, sends his entire wing of nuclear-armed bombers to attack the Soviets. When the Soviet ambassador is called by the president to be informed of the events, he lets the president know that if a single bomber drops a nuclear weapon on Soviet territory, a doomsday device will detonate and destroy the Earth. When asked by the American president, why would you build such a device? Soviet ambassador responds that he thought the Americans were working on one, so they needed one too. Our source was the New York Times. So maybe this is a joke. Or maybe the New York Times has been getting military stories wrong since 1964. The fact is that we're going to keep seeing this, at least until the newsrooms make an effort to hire more veterans and establish a base level of institutional military knowledge. Hey, if you want to fact check me and my results, everything is available for free at ryanbeth.substack.com, although I do not have the funding of the New York Times, so if you want to toss me $5 on my Substack, I'd really appreciate it. You can also support the channel by buying one of my landmine t-shirts from Bunker Branding. Every cent goes to help making content like this. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take us out, 80s training video. In a world where fashion meets firepower, where style becomes strategy, it's time to gear up for the ultimate mission with Bunker Branding. Introducing the Rock Out With Your Chalk Out t-shirt, a tribute to the fearless air cavalry. Feel the adrenaline rush as you don the pride of the skies. For those of you who dare from the air, precision and power unite when you think outside the bomb. And don't miss our Live Laugh Launch t-shirts for Patriot and High Mars, because sometimes defending freedom means bringing the thunder. Finally, for the true defender of the seas, we present Department of the Boat People. Sail with honor and show your allegiance to the world's mightiest maritime force. 
with these shirts, hoodies, and stickers, along with the tow missile, landmines, and drone warfare. These aren't just shirts, they're statements. They're your way of saying I stand for strength, unity, and style. Get yours at Bunker Branding today.